I now have the very distinct pleasure of introducing to you this evening's first keynote speaker, Jeannie Becker. Of course, Jeannie needs no introduction. She is easily one of the most iconic and influential women in the fashion industry, both here in Canada and, of course, around the world. She is currently host of Bell Media's fashion television channel and was the host of fashion television for 27 years. When I spoke to Jeannie recently, she said that it was her vision as host of fashion television to inspire generations of women, mothers and daughters alike, to find their own unique sense of personal style and express it in their everyday lives. And of course, I think she did exactly that for millions of women. Jeannie is also a contributing editor to the Toronto Star and The Kit, a columnist for Metro. She's a published author of five books and a regular style correspondent for Canada AM and eTalk. She also added a dose of style to the Winter, the winter Games, uh, the Winter uh, uh, Games in Vancouver in 2010, with regular fashion segments for CTV, and of course has launched a very successful clothing line, Edit by Jeannie Becker. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming one of the Sun Life Financial Arts and Communication Award winners, Canada's gift to the fashion industry, the one and only Jeannie Becker. Don't be afraid and never give up. That was my late dad's motto, sage advice I still live by every day. Being the child of Holocaust survivors, there was a fearlessness and tenacity drummed into me from a very young age. And though I vividly recall times when I'd hide under the bed when I was little, just so I didn't have to listen to any more of those war stories, Growing up with those tales of hardship, oppression, and horror did wonders to prepare me for a career in a ruthless arena <laughs> that not only is known for eating its young, but also for being obsessed with reinvention. The don't be afraid and never give up mantra was what kept me on track all those years as I attempted the supreme juggling act of trying to have it all all at once. And while I certainly may have dropped some precious balls along the way, I'm happy to report that there were at least a few glorious moments over my past four and a half decades in the business when I honestly did believe that I had it all. The man, the kids, the home, the cars, the clothes, the lifestyle, and of course, that most seductive element of all, the work. For years, my old City TV bio described me as one of their hardest working personalities. I'm still not clear why I never took them to task and hit them up for more cash. <laughs> Fact is, I never did really see it as work. This was my passion, what I aspired to do for as long as I could remember. Perform, communicate, connect, resonate. I was lucky enough to realize from the get-go that there were myriad ways of doing that. Whether I was acting in TV commercials in Toronto, studying theater in New York, or perfecting the art of mime in Paris, each cherished endeavor fed into my own personal skill set. And as my skills grew, I grew. By the time I finally abandoned cocktail waitressing, which by the way was a great education in PR, I highly recommend it, for a serious job with CBC Radio in St. John's, Newfoundland, circa 1975, I was hooked on media, and the more multifaceted, the better. I honed my writing, interviewing, and producing talents, not always sure where my new skills would take me or even even where I wanted them to take me, I just knew I had to keep on doing it, nose to the grindstone, savoring my work every step of the way. Maybe it was because I'd watched my dad all those years, sweating and toiling in a dusty old slipper factory on Adelaide Street at a job he never really liked, though he worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. My dad was adamant about making a better life for us, so he did what he had to do. But the nature of his work brought him little joy, so I always swore that when I grew up, I'd not only take on a career that I respected, but one that I knew would make me happy. And so just as my dad had instructed me to be, I was fearless, 
and tenacious, and many people thought of me as chutzpah personified because I really put myself out there in those early years on a landscape that was inhabited mostly by blonde helmet heads with wasp features and uh, conventional sounding voices. There was nary a big nosed, wide mouthed, a larger than life gal like me around back then. And I certainly had my share of detractors. But timing played a big part in my ability to succeed. And so did the fact that I was egged on by a mad genius named Moses Neimer, who knew exactly which buttons to press to get the required results. What do you stand for, he once asked me on one of his tirades, because I'm not sure you stand for anything, he snickered. He then proceeded to list off names of some of my colleagues and competitors whom he felt really did stand for something. I was mortified. I worked so hard. Had he no respect for that, no regard for what I'd built? I, I was dumbfounded. I didn't know what to say. Should I try to defend myself, scramble to come up with things I thought I stood for? What about truth, justice, and the Canadian way? Wasn't that good enough? Obviously not. So I spent the next few years trying to figure out what my definitive point of view should be. What spin could I put on the way I digested and delivered information that might set me apart in a sea of these TV personalities who were all apparently standing for something. It was a difficult process because so often in those days I was flying by the seat of my pants, treading where no TV reporter had tread before, in rock stars' hotel rooms and smoky tour buses, to designers' ateliers and backstage at fashion shows. What could I stand for in these rarefied arenas, a kid from Downsview, Ontario, with stars in her eyes, who knew what it took to tough things out and hold fast to dreams and never take no for an answer? Unbeknownst to me, this was truly an exercise in personal brand building. As I grew more comfortable in my own skin, I slowly began to see the role I could play for viewers. I wasn't really an expert on much in those early years, just a die-hard fan, but I'd learned a lot about human nature from watching my parents rebuild their shattered lives. My roots kept me real. And so I decided that would be what I stood for, being a real person in a rather unreal world. Taking viewers along with me for the ride began to take on new meaning. I started to see myself as a kind of tour guide. And whether I was talking rock and roll with Keith Richards on a beach in Antigua or dropping in on Carl Lagerfeld at the Chatel, Chanel Couture studio the day before his big show or getting into a bathtub with Andy Summers of the police or, or trying on wigs in Raquel Welch's bedroom or visiting Betsy Johnson in the Hamptons or hanging in Rio with John Galliano or going swimming with Esther Williams in Beverly Hills. And we have it all in our Bell Media archives, folks. I was determined to expose this extraordinary fantasy-filled life I was living and let viewers really see things through my eyes. I also began to write more. I wasn't much of a writer at first, but my friend Bonnie Brooks, who was editing Flair at the time, offered me a page in the magazine each month to write about my life, whatever aspect of it I wanted to share, whether it was about some celebrity I interviewed or my relationship with my hairdresser or the pain of my marriage breakup or riffing on a hot new trend or what my daughters were teaching me, I let it rip each month, allowing readers to see who I was. For about a decade, I exposed myself, warts and all. Do you have to tell everything, my dear mother would constantly ask me. Yes, I do, I tell her, because the most precious gifts we can give one another are our own personal stories. My columns became a reality check, both for me and for my readers, and helped nurture an intimate connection with a whole new generation of people who were growing up watching our show. In the meantime, I was honing my writing skills and savoring experiences long after the cameras stopped rolling. Like most of us women who blossomed in the 80s, I was determined to have it all. I still am, actually, though having just turned 60 this year, time may be running out. But back in 1987, at the age of 35, I figured it was time to have a baby before it was too late. 
My timing wasn't great. Two years earlier, we'd launched fashion television, and the show was taking off. Still, I knew I had to have this baby, or as my mom used to say, the store would close. <laughs> I was terrified to tell my bosses that I was pregnant. Now remember, those were the days when you could only take three months mat leave and no one promised that they would hold your job for you when you got back. You'd have work when you got back, all right, but it might not be the same job. I had worked my butt off to create my job and now that I was on a hit show, how could I possibly think of giving that up? So when are you coming back to work, asked the wily Mr. Zneimer when I was about eight and three quarters months pregnant, just ready to pop. Because, you know, there's a lineup of 20-something girls outside my office door clamoring to host fashion television. I was freaked and without skipping a beat, defensively shot back, oh, don't you worry, I'll be back in just a couple of weeks. And true to my word, I was. The same went for baby number two a couple of years later. I can't say I'm proud to have missed spending more time with my darling daughters so early on in their lives, but I honestly believe there was no other way, at least not if I wanted to keep my job, one I had created, one that I poured so much passion into, one that continued to inspire me daily. Did my girls suffer for it? I can't say for sure, but they seem to have grown up to be very independent, creative, loving, solid human beings. The precarious juggling act that ensued for many years was indeed a challenging one. I cried myself to sleep in hotel rooms the world over. There were undoubtedly nights when my babies yearned to have me there to tuck them in or to comfort them. But still, we managed. And these were the days before emails and Skype, of course, but I always had my cell phone on and I used my hotel fax machines religiously. I also refused to work weekends and every Friday when the girls were little, we'd all pile into the SUV, our two cats and Sheldon the turtle included, and we would drive to our cozy little cottage retreat, just the family, so we could all spend quality time together. We did that 48 weekends a year for almost 10 years and it was one of the happiest times of my life. Things became more difficult when my marriage suddenly ended in 1998. The girls were eight and 10. And as a single mom, I scrambled to construct a meaningful new life for them. I, I bought a farm and a big dog and injected new spirit into our tiny team. Don't be afraid, I heard my late father's voice say, and never give up. Like my parents taught me, I had to show my kids that life goes on despite the devastation. I started taking the girls on exotic trips and continued to pour myself into my work. My TV gig was still bubbling up and I began writing a weekly newspaper column and I even wrote my first book. The girls grew up to not only understand but accept that my work is simply a part of who I am. I want your job. You know, that is something I've heard 10,000 times, mostly from younger women. It's flattering that I've made my work look so appealing, but I do always tell those who covet my job to go get their own job. <laughs> After all, my multifaceted job didn't exist before I dreamed it up, and I worked like a dog to shape it into something tangible and lasting. Young people today have to dream bigger, believe more strongly, be more fearless, and remain more steadfast than ever before. They have no other choice. This is not a world that celebrates followers. Success comes to those with unique voices who color outside the lines, and most importantly, who blaze trails. We must never urge our children to follow in our footsteps. They must be encouraged to be originals, take things to the next level, and so inspire the world. This next generation certainly has its work cut out for it. As for me, well, I'm thrilled to still be on this trek 45 years after my first foray into television. To be named one of the country's most powerful women is the icing on the cake, so thank you, WXN for this wonderful honor. Of course, we all know that power can be a bit of an illusion. 
There are too many variables out there to control, too many disparate hearts and minds to have absolute influence over. I suppose my own personal power lies simply in the passion and energy I continue to have for this amazing career that I've cultivated, continue to cultivate. What a blessing that's been. And now, thanks to Bell Media, I'm set to embark on the next chapter with an exciting new lifestyle venture called The Loop. Do stay tuned. <laughs> in the meantime, I may wear six inch heels, but I am hell bent on having both feet firmly planted on the ground, staying as real as I possibly can and remaining as fearless, tenacious and ultimately passionate as I did when I first started out on this arduous but exhilarating journey. With any luck, the best is yet to come. Thank you. <laughs>